Simon Costin, welcome to Show Studio. Thank you. And um, tell me, we were talking a little bit about it before, and it seems like it's a sort of a, a really nice story. Tell me about how you first met Lee McQueen. So Lee had seen um, some body sculpture jewellery that I'd made during the mid late nine, uh, 80s mm. and I use things like sort of uh, birds feet earrings and claws and animal pieces and this sort of thing and he wrote to me as a student from Central St Martin saying I know you're probably not making jewellery anymore but mm. could have you got anything left I could use for my degree show and I I don't know I had about eight eight nine pieces left necklaces headdresses and and um, yeah, Lee used them for his degree shows. So that's the first time we met. And what made you want to kind of respond to him and say yes? Because you, did you get requests like that? Was it just because it was such a bizarre request? Was it um, the way he approached you? No, I just, I'm always keen to help students because mm. I was one. So I'd, vo I'd all, you know, I would appreciate that if I was a student asking for, and so yeah, I was just more than happy to help out. I mean, obviously nobody knew him from Adam at that point. So. Yeah. Uh, but he was so funny. That's what, and we just got on really well. Mm. So um, I thought, yeah, yeah, of course you can. And I trusted him because the jewellery, some of it was quite fragile. So, yeah. And I'd learn things before and they come back damaged or, but they were perfect. And tell me, so he was so funny, but was there, was it that that made you kind of want to collaborate with him, work with him? Was it him as a person or did you see his work and kind of really see something in that as well? I'd like to say it was a work, but to be honest, we, it, we just went clubbing all the time in <laughs> bars and uh, it, was, it was the friendship first and then the work came later because yeah. at that point um, it hadn't developed very much, you know, just yeah. left college, so it was all very early, early mm. on. But no, it was very much the friendship that, that sparked that rela working relationship. Mm. And also I'd trained in theatre design. Yeah. <coughs> and. Um, I kept thinking, oh, I could, I could do your catwalk, I could yeah. do your shows. But you know, he didn't have any money at that point, and um, I'd never done shows before mm. at all. So it was only later, I think The Birds was the first show I sort of you painted on. a stripe down the middle of the road. Yeah. I mean, we had nothing, we had no money whatsoever. Yeah. And I was begging black drapes and things to put in the background. And so yeah, tell me a bit about the time between sort of first meeting him and working, you know, lending the jewellery and then, and then moving to the point where you were doing these incredible kind of like, you know, installations and, sh and show spaces and sets for him. How, how did that sort of come about? Well, at the, at the time it seemed much longer, but actually looking at the timeline, it was quite yeah. rapid. His, yeah. his sort of rise was, was quite rapid from Highland Rape to the birds, which came afterwards, I think. Yeah. Um, his sort of ascension was pretty pretty quick and it was mostly due, the scale of things was mostly due to um, Amex coming on board, American yeah. Express. Uh, no, American, American... Yeah, American Express. Express. Yeah. No, that's right, yeah, 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 right. yeah Amex, yeah. <laughs> <coughs> so when they came on board, the whole thing ratcheted up yeah. pretty, pretty quickly. So, yeah, we went from having no money and not being paid a penny mm. to actually having some budget to, to start working on ideas. And did that change things or did it just mean you could do things you wanted to do? I suppose it changed pressure-wise. Yeah. There was a lot more sort of uh, pressure due to the budget, you know, how that was uh, managed and navigated. But Sam Gainsbury was doing the show production, so she was really in charge of all that. Mm. I was just coming up with ideas with Lee to try and mm. work out how best to show the collection. And tell me about that process. Would he come to you with a kind of very specific brief, a very clear idea of what the show was about, or would it be more about a conversation? Would you suggest things? It, it, it's hard to say, really. It's very yeah. organic. It's like us sitting here, if we were talking about a, a show. But I mean, there were times when I'd go around for a production meeting mm. and just listen to Lee talking about his disastrous one-night stand, or whatever it was, yeah. <laughs> <coughs> or my disastrous one-night stand. So, um, <laughs> It was a very organic, it wasn't sort of, we'd sit down with our notepads and yeah. it was very sort of, or we'd be in a bar and we'd see something, a pop promo, I can remember we were in Compton's or somewhere awful, and there was a pop video from, I can't remember, America or something, and there was an effect in it, and we thought, oh, that'd be great to do in a show. Mm. So it was very organic, we were like sponges really, yeah. getting ideas, magpie-like from, from all over the place. Mm. And do you know, because it's so interesting, I think, how history kind of rewrites things, and I think, you know, in history, people talk about his shows and the spectacle and the theatre, and it seems very kind of considered like he was sort of a, a provocateur who came along and knew that he wanted to kind of astound and mm. 
shock and you know both delight and affront people with his shows. Did you get that sense from him? Was there a sense of like let, let's show them, let's do this? And yeah, he yeah. was very. I mean, it, it was probably wasn't as considered as you might imagine it was. Yeah. It, 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 he didn't have this sort of agenda that he was okay. I need to do this to shock someone. I need yeah. to do this. It, but he was very ballsy and in your face anyway as yeah. a character. So that was just came naturally to him. Mm. But he didn't have a sort of speci specific agenda that um, involved that. It was just him. It was just the way yeah, he expressed himself like was quite um, in your face, mm. quite uh, confrontational. And he liked mixing it up. He liked, you know, saying inappropriate things to journalists, and he loved all that. Mm. So. Were you aware at the time how shocking some of the stuff you were doing was? Did you did you think? No. You're so close to it. In t in yeah. retrospect, it's very easy to say, um, wasn't that wasn't that unusual? Wasn't that yeah. quite groundbreaking? Or wasn't that? But at the time, you're just doing it. You know, mm. you're just sort of involved in the process. So um, it's only in retrospect, really, that. You have that luxury. Mm. And tell me about some of the sort of the favourite moments because you talked before in interviews about Untitled, which mm. I believe was meant to be called Golden Showers, but then he had to change it because of the sponsorship, yeah. because of yeah. the connotations of that praise. So well, initially they didn't know what it meant, and then yeah, somebody it looked it up. <laughs> I was like, mm, okay. <laughs> so then it became Untitled. But you said that that's yeah. a favourite. What? Why is that? Tell me. Personally, it was a favourite for me because it was the first time I could really. Um, work with the collection because all the all the staging always came from the collection. It's, yeah. It was never the other way around. It was always how best to complement that collection and, and draw out narrative threads that the audience may not be aware of, say, when they just That's view the collection. So I would try to give layers of meaning to the presentation mm. to inform people as to other aspects of the creative process, mm. if that makes sense. So. Untitled was the first time where we actually got, Lee sort of knew slightly in advance for once, mm. <laughs> that what the collection was going to be, the first half was predominantly black. And so we talked about having a white cat walk. And then for there to be a moment when it changed, <coughs> and it was sort of really looking at lots of yin yang symbols and mm. polar opposites and negative and positive, and for it to change into a black cat walk. Mm. And it would have been very easy to just to light it up and turn the lights off to make it go black. But mm. It's a bit boring. <laughs> so I had seen these um, fish tanks, and it was a, a system for draining and filling them again with fresh water, and where the water came down, then came up, and it didn't kill the fish, you know, boring. <laughs> but <coughs> we did a little test, or I did it at home in a, two buckets. <laughs> Glamorous. <very> tech. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> so the idea came about to have a water-based catwalk that then filled with black ink and it was mm. the ink that obscured the light underneath. But it was Lee who actually said, why don't we just exit the runway and give that full moment, that sort of 10 minutes it took. Because if ever you see the film, uh, the film footage of the show online, they've cut all that. They've cut that bit out, yeah. But the audience actually sat for 10 minutes and watched these ominous black clouds of ink spreading through the water mm. and obscuring the light underneath. So it was a really, it became a piece of installation of theater, art yeah. in its own right. So that's what I liked about it. Yeah. Mm. It's interesting, the idea of using the set and using those kind of, the installation and the surroundings almost to explain the clothes mm. and explain the collection. It was, it was that quite dear to him that people could understand it? Because I think there was a lot of misinterpretation of his work. Yeah, that happened quite a constantly. lot. Yeah. yeah. It was, but <coughs> I mean, if, if if I'm being honest, there's only a small percentage of the audience who was seeing that those shows who would be visually illiterate enough. Totally. Visually literate. Sorry, <laughs> most of them are visually illiterate. No, but do you know what I mean? To to actually yeah. understand those nuances. The, exactly the subtleties. So it was fine to put them in. Yeah. But whether or not everyone would get them or not, who knows? But it was important that they were there yeah. for me anyway. Um, and for Lee, yeah. Of course. It's interesting because you were saying how you kind of kept, you've always kept journals and you've kept notes about sort of Dante and some of the other shows. Mm. What, what, were you, what have you written about? Tell me about your it's, experience. Well, it's funny, you know, because I never ever look at my journals ever. And I've kept a journal since I was 11. And um, it's only because recently of people asking stuff and I've got a memory like a sieve. Yeah. <laughs> so thank God. 
I've actually got all the nitty gritty that went on. Does it make you think about it differently? Because I imagine it's interesting what we're saying, but how people remember the shows. You must almost look back a little bit with rose tinted glasses and remember how amazing yeah. it was. But then I imagine that process, even like doing the test with the buckets, it yeah. kind of yeah, it makes yeah. you remember the difficulties as yeah. well. But and also people become mythologized and, and absolutely you know, and uh, which is a really interesting process. It's tragic that it ended in the way that it did. Mm. But seeing that process of an individual that you knew as somebody you'd go to the LA with mm. and prop the bar up, becoming something else mm. is, is absolutely fascinating. And I mean, I'm quite honoured to have been a part of that. Yeah. Um, but it is really interesting. Psychologically, it's very, yeah. very interesting. And I think when someone's legacy becomes removed from, from them and from the people around them, and he can become remembered for things that I think perhaps wouldn't have been things, even aesthetically, wouldn't have been things that necessarily he would have chosen mm. to be really associated. It's really interesting that I think a lot of a lot of people we've talked to in this series have talked about that that idea of how kind of history be rewritten and mm. and him being this kind of great British designer, even though a lot of what he did was really criticised and he was a really yeah. difficult character as well. I think a lot oh, of yes. people, yeah, which, which doesn't <laughs> get talked about that much, I think yeah. it's an interesting one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, but yeah. So tell me, what, what are you even... Oh, well, uh, there's just this, because most of it's scandalous. <laughs> but um, I found the entry of, of the Dante show. Yeah. Because I made quite a lot of um, the headdresses and the masks and bits mm. and pieces for the show. Because there wasn't a set. It was at um, Spitalfields, um, at the Hawksmoor Church. And really, it was all about the lighting. Simon Chaudoir did this amazing lighting rig. Actually, this reminds me of it. <laughs> of thousands of light bulbs in a cruciform oh, shape. And that was the sort set, of yeah. the set. And at that point, Spitalfields Church was really run down. It was mm. sort of there looking for money to renovate it. And there were massive holes in the floor. Yeah. And I'd forgotten all that stuff. You know, how actually cobbled together in a, a way, lot was, a lot of yeah. it was. Yeah. Everyone imagines it's probably some, you know, slick, smooth running. Yeah, um, not at all. Yeah. <coughs> it was absolute chaos a lot of the time. And um, the running joke was always poor Sam Gainsby who had to deal with all this <laughs> stuff to make the show happen. Yeah. It would inevitably be in floods of tears at the end of it, just with relief. <laughs> that it kind else. of came together. But it was like, where's Sam? Oh, she'll be crying. She'll be, yeah. she'll be in floods. <laughs> so um, it was really quite sweet. But um, yeah, it was just a description of the... Um, of the show, it was what happened afterwards, really. The show was an hour and a quarter late. Which I love. You couldn't do that today. No. Uh, there's Brian Ferry and Mark Harmon, too. Um, Lee looked completely shattered. He was pinned in a corner by camera crews who were queuing down the corridors, waiting to shine bright lamps in his face and ask all the same questions. He later said he felt like a fucking parrot. <laughs> um, I helped clear up and congratulated all the girls, most of whom it was their first show. Um, for many of them had been, yeah, for the first show. Eventually, Lee and I left to go for a drink at the local pub, The Gun. Mm -hmm. um, it was packed and I could see it wasn't going to last long. He'd hoped that his ex wasn't going to be there, but he was. Um, so that finished the evening and Lee got in a taxi and went home. But it's that kind of... I love that. Yeah, when you it think... Was, it, it would never have happened later. He yeah. never would have gone to the local pub with me round the corner and then... You know, yeah, it's just a nice little window at the, at the small scaleness of it. Yeah, because you think Dante now is so iconic and yeah. people talk about it and you see the imagery from it and the thought that afterwards he left and went to the pub and was sad about his ex-boyfriend and got yeah. a taxi home. It kind of, yeah, yeah it's interesting that, isn't yeah. it? How big so that work's become. Yeah, but it's interesting. What was refreshing reading these again was the most of what I'm writing about isn't actually the shows. Yeah, it's, it's us going out or yeah. having a gossip or picking people up or doing whatever we were doing. Just was it the hard to side keep that it. kind of personal side with the professional side? Because obviously, you know, the bigger things got and the more the attention he got, you know. Yeah, that stopped. Yeah. It all stopped, really. Yeah. Especially when Givenchy happened, because he, I mean, he had to do Ready to Wear, the couture, his own line. Mm. It was massive. Yeah, yeah and he was constantly working, 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 working. Mm. And under a huge amount of pressure. Mm. Yeah. And that was reflected in the social side, sadly. Yeah. yeah. And also it was that weird thing where you'd go to a, when we were in Paris, you'd go to a club, and all of a sudden we're in a roped off enclosure. And it's like, yeah. that never used to happen. Yeah. And it just felt, you could feel that disconnect coming, developing there, mm. I think. 
when mm. Givenchy happened. All of a sudden, you couldn't go out in the way that you used to be able to go out because you were in a rope trough enclosure. Or yeah. So it was funny. Yeah. Strange fame, to watch it happen. Yeah, it's strange. Fame kind of pushed, it gets pushed on people who maybe don't suit being famous. Yeah. Yeah, it's difficult. Yeah. Did he? Um, was he good at? I think one of the things I find interesting when you talk to people about Lee is they say, oh, you know, he never took no for an answer. You know, he had these amazing ideas, and you know, even just some of the testimony from the people that worked at him with him at Givenchy, they kind of say they were, you know, scared of getting almost injured by how how sort yeah. of vicious he was when he was working on a garment and that yeah. real determination. Was that similar to your experiences? You know, if he wanted something, no matter how theatrical or technically impossible, it had to happen. Not not so much with the set because. Yeah. He was quite happy, it was my sort of realm mm. more. Um, so as long as he was convinced by the initial idea, which was all very much, it came up between Sam and Katie and me. It wasn't mm. just one person doing one. Mm. We all fed into each other in those early days. It was mm. much more um, organic. Fluid, yeah. Um, and somebody would have seen a film and said, oh, you know that point where that, yeah. like in its jungle out there, the, I'd seen Bonnie and Clyde, mm. uh, it's a late night, Thing and it was the scene with all the bullet holes in the wall, and with that light shining through. So, and then Simon Shodwar knew the film and said, "Oh, well, you could put a huge 10k light behind." Oh. So it was all very organic. And that, I yeah. guess, that goes back to what you're saying before. That became impossible after a certain point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was too big. big. You couldn't. You, and also there wasn't the opportunity to have those sorts of meetings yeah. where everyone was sat around the table having a gossip and a, a laugh and chatting yeah. about an idea. Everyone was so busy. So yeah. I was left to a large extent at Givenchy to just get on with it and yeah. schedule a meeting in with Lee and you would have half an hour and yeah. you know, you'd show ideas and it'd be yes, no, yes, no, that's good, that's bad, yeah. change that. And off I'd go again. What was the last show you worked on together? Um, I did the two couture, two ready to wear at Givenchy, mm. and then the last McCoon would have been on Tightwood. But we'd already started working on the next one, mm. and had ideas for the next, the London show. But you know, I was off by then. Off doing something else. Do yeah. you have? Do you look at the early shows and think that they were his best? Oh no. No. No, no, no. I just, no. I would, I would have loved to have been along for the ride to develop the ideas further. I mean, I loved yeah. the the. Um, the, with the robot, and the robot yeah. arms, yeah. there was, yeah, yeah, Spray painting. Yeah. Oh no, I'm not, yeah, going to pretend that the early shows were the best. Yeah. No, they, they, they were all fantastic. You know, yeah. Right, so. What's your kind of lasting memory of Lee then? Just those kind of going to the pub? Yeah, that dirty guttural laugh really is one, is one thing, but I don't know, I think it was um, his vulnerability as well. He's incredibly sort of insecure on lots of levels. And mm and vulnerable and he would mask that with the brashness and the ballsiness and mm. um, but yeah there was a, there was a huge insecurity there but but I guess in a way that's what makes him so brilliant that contradiction between you know dark and light energy and yeah sort of quietness and disruption and yeah the two yeah two worlds together yeah thank mm. you so much Simon pleasure